We're kicking off a new teaching series today titled Ministry. Life is messy. Life is messy. Ministry, welcome to the mess. Welcome to the mess. And uh, we chose this because we wanted uh, the church to understand as these scriptures come alive that life is messy. Ministry is, is messy. It's not always Sunday best, right? Uh, whatever that might mean to you. Uh, <laughs> It, it, it's not always smooth sailing. Everything doesn't always go how you think it should go. And as we grow in Christ, we come to be thankful for that. Because we wouldn't be thankful for that. We wouldn't ask God for other paths or other plans uh, in, our, uh, in our amount of wisdom. But as he's sovereign over all things, he orchestrates the plans in our lives. And so uh, we must be a people of trust, praise, and thanksgiving for all things that come into our lives. But as we study the gospel of Matthew together, what we notice is that life isn't easy. Like these 12 disciples that Jesus said, come and follow me, and they gave up everything. They gave up their vocation to follow him. I don't know that they really knew what they were signing up for, just like you and I really didn't know what we were signing up for. But we knew that Jesus is the way, that there's power in Jesus, that Jesus is indeed the miracle worker, that Jesus is indeed the savior of my soul. I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 14 as Pastor Rowley, one of our elders, read the scripture. Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 14. The main idea today is that in this life, there will be moments of sadness. In this life, there will be moments of sadness. And you might be thinking, why? I just want, I just want joy. And I, just want, I just want peace. But as we look at the landscape of society, we see that there is no joy and there is no peace apart from Jesus Christ, that we live in a fallen world, a broken world, a sinful world, a dark world. And so there will be moments of, of sadness. There's not one person in this room I'm convinced of that has not walked through a season of sadness. I mean, if you're living, if you're breathing, I'm convinced of it. You have experienced some kind of loss or some kind of grief. Or there's burdens in your life. And the question is, what do we do with it? Today, we're going to look at how we should deal biblically with loss or with grief in, in our lives. But, but let's begin with verse 1, Matthew 14, at that time. As we're studying the word of God, I would encourage you, ask questions. And as we're studying through the word of God, as you're reading through the word of God, ask questions. At that time, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Matthew writes, at that time, and you should ask yourself, well, what time? What time is it? At that time, you look back in context, Jesus has just been rejected in Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was the hometown of Jesus. He grew up in Nazareth, and he's gone all through the regions, town to town, speaking with authority, calling people to repent that the kingdom of heaven is near, healing all of these miracles. He comes back to his town expecting to do the same, and guess what? He's not greeted well. <laughs> and he, not greeted well. Verse 58 of chapter 13 says, and he did not do Many miracles there because of their unbelief. He said before that, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his household. And some of you maybe you've experienced that. And so at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus. Again, Jesus, his name and his fame is growing. I mean, it's growing the masses are coming just to see, just to, to hear. 
His name and his fame are growing. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch, or Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas. Now, this is not Herod that was ruling and reigning when Jesus was born. Don't get it confused. This is, that was Herod the Great. And, and he was great at one thing. He was great at building. He was great at building, Herod the Great. But he was a terrible person. I mean, you read through history, you see that, I mean, he wouldn't think twice about murdering somebody, his own family. He was a terrible person. It was the same Herod the Great that uh, the word got out that there's a new king in town. And he's like, no, nah, I'm the only king. I'm the only king. And so what does he do? He tries to coax the wise men into, hey, go check this out, man, and come back and give me a report. And thankfully, they were wise enough to not go back. But what does he do? He said, okay, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to make a decree to slaughter all the firstborn boys in every family. I mean, that's how terrible of a person Herod the Great was. And so here's his son now. Here's his son, Herod Antipas. He's now ruling and reigning. If you don't think, parents, grandparents, listen, if you, great-grandparents, uh, I don't think we got any, like, more than that, uh, and so, uh, but if you don't think your life and your decisions and your example matters, just look through history. Oh, it matters. And I'm, I'm saying all of this before we go further in the text, to have, uh, help us have the context of who really are we dealing with, Herod the Tetrarch or Herod Antipas. He learned so much from his father. He watched his father rule and reign with an iron fist. Herod the Great dies in Matthew chapter 2, verse 19. We, we, read, we already read about that. We can, we can reread about that. Matthew chapter 2, verse 19, Herod the Great dies. And so then comes uh, Herod Antipas. He's ruling and reigning over this specific region. He's heard about Jesus. He would have known about Jesus. His brother Archelaus it, it ruled to the south, and his brother Philip ruled to, to, the, to the north. Verse 2, this is John the Baptist, he told his servants. He has been raised from the dead, and that's why miraculous powers are at work in him. Herod was convinced that Jesus was John the Baptist, raised from the dead. Herod was sure that John's return from the afterlife in the form of Jesus was what gave him miraculous powers. Well, if you're new to the faith, you might be wondering, well, who's John the Baptist? John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus. Matthew chapter 3, go home and read it later on today. Matthew chapter 3 gives us insight. Here's a crazy man who speaks boldly and runs around telling people, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's John the Baptist. He was a forerunner of Jesus. He was preparing the way for Jesus. It's also related to Jesus. And so, Herod thinks that Jesus is John the Baptist that's come back to life. I mean, he had all kinds of crazy thoughts and crazy viewpoints. And he says to his servants, this is John the Baptist, Jesus. This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That's why his miraculous power are at work within him. We see in verse 3, kind of a flashback. To help us understand. For Herod had arrested John, chained him, put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Since John had been telling him, it's not lawful for you to have her. Now, most scholars would agree that somewhere around two years, John the Baptist has been in prison. Herod, Antipas, Throws John the Baptist in prison. Why? Because John the Baptist stands up for truth. Stands up for what is right. What a call for us as the church to stand up for biblical truth, not popular lies. Amen. 
Now more than ever, we need to hear that. The church needs to rise up, answer the call to stand up for biblical truth, biblical values, not buy into the lies of society, the lies of the evil one. Satan is the deceiver and the father of all lies. Jesus said that. And so who are you listening to? And what are you standing for? John was willing to stand up for what was right. He said, ah, you're married. In fact, you're married to the king of Petra's daughter. What are you doing? He's standing up boldly. This is John the Baptist. And so as a result, Herod Antipas throws him in jail. And so he's been in jail. Verse 3 and on, give us a, a, a flashback. Help us understand that, that all along he's been in, in jail. Takes us back. Put him in prison on account of Herodias, his br brother Philip's wife. Since John had been telling him, it's not lawful for you to have her. Verse 5, though Herod wanted to kill John, he feared the crowd since they regarded John as a prophet. He wanted, he wanted to kill him, right? Because he didn't agree with him. Because he stood up to him. But Herod Antipas feared the crowd. And so he just left him in jail. Verse 6, when Herod's birthday celebration came, Herodias' daughter danced before them and pleased Herod. Now, again, Herod Antipas married, but sees this other lady, and like what he sees, what he wants, he's going to get. His father did it. Why not him? And so he goes after Herodias. He gets Herodias. And then Herodias is deceiving. Oh, you better be careful. You think the grass looks greener on the other side. You better be careful. He gets Herodias, and Herodias gets what she wants. Here's Herodias' daughter, which would have been Herod Antipas' niece, dancing in some kind of sexual way. I mean, this is crazy, but this is what's happening. Again, the older generation, you think your life doesn't matter, you think your time doesn't matter, you think your example doesn't matter. It matters more than, than you will ever know. And so Herod's pleased by what he sees. So he promised, verse 7, with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she answered, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. Again, I, I can't drive this point home any, any more. It, it's so important to hear. Yesterday we were, went to the bonfire hayride did anybody wait in the hour drive for that praise God and uh it was a test of patience and my testimony for the Lord to my family and uh but nevertheless that's, that's not a part of the story right <laughs> so uh we're standing in line my ladies are using the restroom after the hour wait you know you had to go and so um we're standing in line for the hayride which was kind of like a shuttle and a hayride it was really exciting and so uh we're waiting in line I'm waiting in line for the hayride. My ladies are in this long line for the restroom. And uh, my heart was broken. My heart was broken. Here's this little kid. He's running around having a great, great old time. And his, and his mom calls him over and says, stay here. We're going to go in, 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 in this hayride. And he said, well, can I play while we're waiting in this line? She said, no. And she looks, she looks at him. And she says, shut up. She looks at him. She goes, shut the F up. And then she slaps him. And everything within me was like, Lord, what do I do in this moment? Do I choke her out? <laughs> like, and then not be here today? I don't know. Do I, do I slap her like she slapped him? Now, thankfully, you know, if there is any, thankfully, it was like, his arm was like this because he was crying. He was like getting his tears and it was just slap the man. And my heart broke for that little boy because I could just only imagine the, the, what he's growing up in and an example that is being set for him and how will he parent his children. And so uh, if any of y'all are parenting like that, let's please schedule a meeting with me and let's talk about biblical parenting because there is a better way. I can guarantee you, I can assure you there is a better there is a better way. And I'm not saying we avoid discipline. No, 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 no. No, we will discipline. But we will discipline with, with, with love and by the grace of God. And 
It's just heartbreaking. And so here, here's Herod Antipas with the great example of his father, Herod the Great, the not-so-great example. And what does it result in? John the Baptist's head on a platter. John the Baptist's head on a platter. Look to, look to verse 9. Although the king regretted it, he regretted it. He commanded that it be granted because of his oaths and his guests. So he sent orders and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought on a platter, gave it, uh, given to the girl who carried it to her mother. Then his disciples came, removed the corpse, a corpse buried it, and went and reported to Jesus. Here's John, John's disciple, John the Baptist's disciple. I mean, they had walked with him. They had learned from him. That they had seen an example of boldness in him. Surely they were living for, for the glory of God and, and, and continuing to preach the, the, the same message of repentance and that the kingdom of heaven is near. And they get word that John the Baptist has been beheaded. They come and pick up his corpse. And they go bury it. And then they go and report it to Jesus. In, in this life, there, there will be moments of sadness. How do, we, how do we bear it? How do we deal with it? How, how do we continue to live? Even as we all face Sadness, loss, grief, problems, burdens in some form or another. First, I, I want us to understand that even Jesus had moments of sadness. You read through the Gospels, you see it. Matthew chapter 23, he's lamenting over Jerusalem. He's lamenting. Read the account. Matthew chapter 23 verse 37. He's, he's looking over Jerusalem and he's lamenting. He's pouring out his heart to the Lord. John eleven thirty five, 35, one of the shortest verses in the Bible. And maybe some of y'all are going to learn a Bible verse today. It's John eleven thirty five. 35. I assure you, you can learn it. Uh, it's Jesus wept. All right? Now you can go home and say, man, I learned a Bible verse today. And so, <laughs> but Jesus, Jesus wept. Even Jesus had moments of sadness. And so how do we deal? How do we deal biblically with sadness, with grief, the first, I would encourage you to write this down, the word pause. Pause. And what are we pausing? Pause to rest, more specifically. Pause to, to rest. We see in verse 13 of Matthew uh, chapter 14, con continuing, when Jesus heard about it, when Jesus ho heard the report from the disciples, he withdrew from there by boat to a remote place to be alone. After hearing this, this news, after receiving this, this news of John the Baptist, his death, Jesus paused to rest. I wonder your response to, to loss, to grief. I, I know many people that try to be as busy as possible so, so as if it didn't happen. And, and I'm telling you, if you don't pause, if you don't pause to rest, if you don't pause to grieve and allow this process, how God created and designed our bodies, you pause to rest. There is coming a time where you will explode. You will unravel. And you might be thinking, you don't know how strong I really am. I, I don't care how strong you think you really are. You better pause to rest. Jesus received this news, and what does he do? He withdrew himself. He paused from, from, from ministry to rest. Pause to rest. Psalm 34 verse 18 says this, The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. Write that reference down. And the next time you experience some kind of a loss or some kind of grief or some kind of burden that seems too big to bear, something that's crushing to you, go to the scripture as you pause to rest, the Lord is near the brokenhearted. Pause to rest. Second, would you write this down? Pray to the Lord. 
Now, you might be thinking, well, that's a little, you know, elementary. Well, we're, we're, we're elementary people, okay? And so we need reminders, right? We need reminders because, hey, be honest, the first, time, first response is often, sadly, not to go to God in prayer. Man, I got to call my best friend. You know, I, I got I to post this thing on, on, on social media. Whatever the response is, pray. Allow prayer to be our first response, not our last resort. Pray to the Lord. Take your burdens before him. Take your loss before him. Take your heart, your heavy heart before him. Take your situation to the Lord. Psalm 55 verse 22 says this. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Psalm 55 verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord. Philippians chapter 4, would you write this down? Philippians 4 verse 6 says this. Don't worry about anything, but in everything. Don't, don't, don't be anxious for anything, but, 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 but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, what are we called to do? Present your request to God. Present your request to God. And the result, this is the result. Are you ready? The result is this. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, that blows our mind. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When you are suffering loss and you are in the midst of grief, pray to the Lord. Take your burden before the Lord. Pray to the Lord. Also, trust. As you pray, trust that he is present. I'll be reminded that he is, he is near. He is right here. Listen to a well-known uh, psalm, Psalm 23, verse 4. Even when I go through the darkest valley whatever your valley looks like. I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. We're looking for comfort in all the wrong places. We're oftentimes looking for comfort. Why do we do the things we do? Because we're trying to self-medicate or self-comfort rather than allowing the Lord to comfort us. Why do we turn to the food? Why do we turn to the food? Why do we turn to the drug? Why do we turn to the alcohol? Why do we turn to the porn? Why do we turn to the relationship? We're trying to fill the void that only can be filled by the creator of all things. Amen. Allow him to comfort you like no one or no thing could ever comfort you. Whenever you're going through that dark valley, I'll be reminded and encouraged and the best way to do that is through prayer, that he is here. The experience of, of loss is unique to each person. The sadness, the numbness, the shock, the confusion, the anger, uh, the exhaustion. Man, listen, they all hit. They all hit us differently. But no matter how you experience grief, Jesus comes and meets you at your point of need. Jesus comes and meets you right there. Pray to the Lord. Trust that he is present, but also trust that he has a plan. And as you, as you pray, he begins to, to reveal that next step. Perhaps not the whole story. I've, I've never, he's never revealed the whole thing to me, but he's, also, he, he's revealed that next step. As I spend time praying with him, pray to the Lord. Trust that he is present and has a plan. Psalm 62, verse, verse 5 Write that reference down. Rest in God alone, my soul, my, for my hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will not be shaken. Verse, verse 7, my salvation and glory depend on God, my strong rock. My refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is our refuge. Pour out your hearts before him. Trust him. Pray. In the darkest moments of your life, I would encourage you, those, those moments that, that you wake up in the middle of the night, the thing that just seems like it just can't leave, you know. We have many options, especially... 2024 of where we can run to but there's one there's one 
and whom we should run to. That will give us the satisfaction and meet us in our time of need. And it is the Lord, our God. Pray. Next, I want to encourage you as you're dealing with, with grief. Some of you right here, right now, you're dealing with grief. And, and, and perhaps, perhaps right now you're on the mountaintop, but there is a valley Come and Be assured of it as we live in this world. The, the next encouragement would, would be to this, would be this partner with believers. Partner with believers. Surround yourself with believers. Don't grieve alone. I believe that we need to pause. There's, there's, there's those moments of intimacy with just you and the Lord. But listen, I encourage you, don't stay alone. Don't stay isolated for too long. There's something special when the church comes alongside there's something special when, when, when somebody looks you in the eye or makes that phone call and you hear their voice. There's something special about someone sacrificing their time to come alongside of you. That's one of the beautiful things of the community of, uh, of faith, that, that we're real people. I, I couldn't imagine, uh, well, I can't imagine because for 29 weeks we were online church only. And, and, and that only lasted like a few weeks of me just preaching to the camera and the camera alone because I felt like a fraud, like, like a, hey, I'm a televangelist now. <laughs> it was terrible. But there's something about looking out and seeing faces and knowing what different people are going through. And when we show up, even when we don't want to show up on a Sunday, maybe some of you are here today. That's you. It was everything but to get here. But there's something about showing up and looking at people in their eyes. That's the church. That's the community of faith. And as we grieve, allow a brother or sister that has already gone through something that you've gone through, come alongside of you and encourage you in the word of God. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2, would you write that reference down? Says this, carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. We need to partner with believers. Allow a brother or sister to carry your burdens because guess what? There's going to be a time when, when, when they need you to carry their burden. There's going to be a time, I guarantee you, it's coming. And so will you allow a brother or sister to come alongside of you? This is the church that Jesus designed and desired for us to be, to be able to carry one another's burdens. When someone asks you how can they pray for you, Tell them. Tell them specifically. And then listen, if you're the one asking, pray specifically for them. And don't just pray, but follow up with them. How's the Lord come through? That's the church coming alive and us partnering together to carry one another's burdens. The last is, is persevere. It, it's a good Baptist message here, all peace. Persevere. The first about persevering, I want to encourage you in those moments of, uh, uh, of grief and sorrow. It's easy to solely focus on, and I'm not saying we shouldn't. No, no, no we, 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 we should focus for a moment on what is it that we've lost. But we can't stay solely focused on the loss, what we've lost. I want to encourage you to persevere. Persevere. When the Spirit of God speaks, and he will, when a brother or sister come alongside of you and encourage you, and you know within your soul that it's go time, that's what I'm talking about. Persevere. You know, one of the best ways to persevere is to start by counting your blessings. We're, we're, we live in a negative world. We don't want to talk about the blessings of God. We don't want to consider the blessings of God. We want to just focus on, oh, is me. This is all I got. God, where are you? He's here. He's pouring out blessings. I mean, if you're breathing, that's a blessing. If you've been saved, that's a blessing. You've been forgiven of all your sins. You, you have a living hope. God has lavished his grace upon you. We have blessing after blessing after blessing. You think for once the enemy wants you to focus on the blessings of God? Nah. He wants you to compare and compete. Oh, look what they have. That's what social media has really done. Look at what they have. Why can't I have that? Now, let's begin, church, to count our many blessings. Name them one by one. Count our many blessings, and let's see what God has done. 
count, count of blessings. Psalm 31, seven says, I will rejoice and be glad in your faithful love because you have seen my affliction. The living God knows, blessed, Psalm 68, 19, blessed be the Lord, day after day he bears our burdens. God is our salvation. Persevere, persevere, count the blessings. Hey, listen, what does it mean to persevere? It means to not give up. I'm thankful for the people that God has placed in my life over all these years at just the right time that have said, hey, don't give up. You can't give up. There's too much on the line to give up. You will keep pushing through. I'm thankful for those people. Hey, why, why, why do you go to the gym with the person to spot you, to coach you, to encourage you? Because if it's up to you, you're going to do like one rep and out, you know, just take pictures and act like you were actually doing something, you know you know, you, you take somebody to the gym to, to push you. Hey, we need that in life. That person to come alongside of us and say, continue to persevere. Continue to persevere. Thanks be to God. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And then we have believers among us. Say, don't give up. There's too much on the line. Life's too precious. Your life is valuable. You matter to God. He has a plan. Trust him. God doesn't create any junk. Trust him. There's a calling on your life. Trust him. Persevere. Persevere. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says, but he said to me, he said to me, Paul's crying out, would you take this, would you take this thorn in my flesh away? But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. This was the Lord's response. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore I, therefore I, will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. Listen to verse 10. So I take pleasure, Paul says, in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties. For the sake of Christ, for when I am weak, then I am strong. When I'm weak, because of the power of God in me, I am strong. Persevere. Persevere. In this life, there will be moments of, of sadness. But listen, the greatest assurance we have is there is a day coming where there will be no more sadness where there will be no more grief, where there will be no more crying, where there will be no, no, more, no more sorrow, no more pain because the previous things have been passed away. There's a day that's coming. It's coming. The question is today, man, are you ready? Will you persevere? I want to ask Ryan and Shannon, would you come? As we begin to close today, church, I, I want you to hear just a part of their story. Just a part of their story. Would you welcome Ryan and Shannon? Hello. Uh, my name is Ryan. This is my beautiful wife, uh, Shannon Reed. Um, I was saved at the age of 19. Uh, Shannon has been serving the Lord for as long as she can remember. On February 21st, uh, which so happened to be my birthday, my wife Shannon was in Cincinnati, Ohio with my son Caden getting a checkup. Um, he got diagnosed with having to have a major open heart surgery, which this was his third open heart surgery. The first one almost took his life. Um, this brought great fear and anxiety into our life. A few hours later, as my wife was in Cincinnati, Ohio, our, our daughter was in a major accident. She ended up breaking her hip and her femur. She was one of the top runners in the uh, area in the state of Florida. Um, this was all on the same day. Um, my wife got home. Uh, we helped my daughter get better. Uh, she had to learn how to walk again and, and stuff like that, just in time for Caden to go into his surgery. Caden had his surgery um, about eight hours after the surgery. His trachea ended up coming apart. Uh, they had to do another emergency surgery. Um, they ended up having to wrap his trachea in a pericardium patch uh, to save his life. He ended up on ECMO for about two months. Um, it ended up 
being a very difficult time in our life. About six months after they had wrapped his trachea in the pericardium patch, it ended up separating. Um, Shannon spent 12 months out of about 24 months in Cincinnati with Caden, Ohio. Our family was separated. I had to stay home with my daughter, uh, which we ended up sending off to college during the middle of all that. Um, those were two years that were extremely difficult in our life. But I wanna tell you, God did bring us through it. God did give us strength. God did encourage us. I got a phone call from the doctor that said, Ryan, I need you to get up here immediately. Um, I ended up on a plane within three hours. Um, I sat down with the doctor and, and he told me that that Caden had made a turn for the worse, that he wasn't gonna make it. I came up there with great hope, great faith, uh, and believing that my son was gonna be okay. Um, I can tell you, I prayed with my whole heart. There's people in this crowd today that, that prayed with us, that believed with us. But as we prayed, the doors were closing. It was evident to me within 24 hours of being up there that the, the doors were closing, that God wanted to bring Caden home. I remember the presence of God was so strong in my life during that period of time. That was a period of time to where I really believed that I experienced the glory of God going through that trial. He was with us. He was giving us strength. I remember the Lord saying, Ryan, just trust me. I made a decision to trust the Lord that day that, that we released him to be, to, to go off of ECMO life support and to go be with the Lord. And I read from the scripture as we stood in that room with 30 medical professionals that, that cared for him, that did everything they could do to, to save his life. I read, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I've decided to trust God uh, through this. Uh, this happened April 26th of this year. Um, it was not that long ago, but, but I wanna tell you and I wanna testify and tell you how good God is. Um, he has supernaturally given us strength. He has been supernaturally healing us and bringing us through this situation. And I'm convinced, I'm convinced that, that God puts these trials in our life to help us get focused on him. I, I'm a firm believer uh, in that. Uh, thank you for letting us share. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place? I, I don't know what your response is today. I don't know how the Lord has spoken to you. It, it's not my job to know. It's simply my calling to proclaim his word and allow his spirit to move to draw some to him today. For him to comfort, to bring peace, not of the world, but his peace. And so I wonder today, What is your response to all of this? In a moment, we're, we're gonna sing this song. And as my bride leads us in singing this song, there's gonna be men and women at different corners of this room and, and there's a host online. There's got to be some here today that are walking around with burdens. Some perhaps recently have lost someone or something dear and I want to encourage you when we begin to sing this song would you have the courage to move and allow a brother or sister to pray over you men with men ladies with ladies would you allow someone to to pray with you to encourage you maybe your decision today is is salvation maybe it's salvation The Bible says that whoever 
calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The message of Jesus is that he is the Savior. He alone is the Savior. I am a sinner. The only way to salvation is through him. Have you called upon the name of the Lord? Have you repented of your sins? Have you believed in your heart that Jesus came over 2,000 years ago? He walked this earth. He died on a cross. He was placed in a grave. And he rose victorious for me, for you. Have you believed that? Have you called upon his name? Perhaps when we begin to sing, that's your next step. That's the starting point of all of it. None of it works apart from salvation. So Lord Jesus, we need you every hour. We need you. And right here, right now, in this moment, we need you. Would you move right here, right now? Would you draw people to yourself? Would you convict uh, of sin? Help us to realize you are the Savior. Lord, help us to put our hope in you. Father, if there's some carrying burdens, Father, I pray that they would cast them over to you, knowing how much you care for us. So we praise you and we thank you. We commit this time to you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. We pray, amen.